Yes, good evening, everybody. Um, maybe some of you know uh, my voice from the radio, NPO Classical, NPO Classic. I've been talking this afternoon in the show in het Nederlands, dus ik moet een beetje omschakelen naar het Engels. Uh, so my guests, Josephine and Bertie, excuse me for um, stupid phrasings since I'm hosting a show in, in the Dutch language on the radio, so I have to switch. But tonight, uh, I will talk to two very young people. I was born in 1988, Josephine in 1994 and Bertie in 1995, if I'm correct. Um, and it's a joy to pick their brains about uh, musical life in Rotterdam and across the globe, since we're talking to uh, travelers. People are soloing all over the, the world. I'm very jealous of them. <laughs> and I'd like to start with Josephine Oleg. Yeah, Josephine, um, did you have a musical day today? Yes, I had a musical day today. Um, maybe some of uh, the friends who are present now were also there for the Dutch concert this afternoon um, at 12.30. So this is a format, it's very often on Wednesdays, where it's sort of an open rehearsal. Um, so yeah, this morning I was rehearsing and at the end we, we did this small lunch concert. And it's interesting because depending on the conductor, it can look more like a concert or more like a rehearsal. So today was very much a rehearsal. Um, Why was that? Was it the clothing of the conductor or uh, some manners or the way he addressed <laughs> the public? I find that we, it was really a working session. So it was a stopping, a uh, lot of stopping, a lot of corrections. Um, yeah, just really to have eyes on the work that we do in rehearsals. And some conductors take it more like a performance. Uh, but this week we play with Maxim Emilianacek, and he wanted to continue working on the on the Rachmaninoff Piano Concerto with wonderful soloist Beatrice Rana. So uh, it was, uh, I hope it was interesting also from the outside. And uh, I hear that for next time the conductors will have a microphone so that the audience can hear better because Sometimes uh, in this big world, it's difficult. Yeah, but it's uh, very interesting for the audience to see, like, uh, uh, under the hood of the of the engine of the orchestra, how, how it works, working on a piece together. Uh, so. yeah. Tirelessly, uh, over and over again, playing those two bars. Um, but with the audience there, you can't roll your eyes like, oh, there we go again, <laughs> and why is he not phrasing right? I, I, maybe that's difficult? No, that's we don't roll so much in our eyes anyway. <laughs> okay. Hey, and you have very busy times ahead, right? So on top of the orchestra, I had a chamber music and solo career. So uh, it takes me different places. And some periods are very busy and some are a little bit lighter. Uh, but the next projects include the chamber music concert in Stockholm in two weeks, after which I go to Germany a few days after that uh, for a recital with piano. And just one week after that, I go to Austria to play the Nielsen Concerto um, with orchestra. So very different projects. And then I come back to the orchestra. Yeah. Um, and let me interrupt just for a second. Uh, Josephine, your, your sound is very breaking up sometimes. If you can speak um, a little bit louder and close close to the microphone, uh, that might help. Okay. okay? I'll you. try that. Yes. But I, uh, I think it's um, very tiring having all those musical pieces uh, simultaneously in your head. Um, in two weeks, I have to play this piece. In a month, I have to do that. How, how do you manage to, to keep yourself straight and uh, not diffuse? Um, it's not so easy. I try to be very organized and to do sort of a ritual planning because, of course, you you don't want to be um, prepared for anything. But sometimes um, you also need, yeah, a, a piece needs also time without practice just to mature in your in your mind. Um, it really depends what you have to play. Um, some pieces actually require a little bit more physical training, a little bit like a sport. So you need to do them sort of every day to, to make sure they stay in your fingers. Um, and some others, they just need to be a little bit more analyzed. Maybe you need to listen to them a little bit before. 
um, even before starting to practice them, just to approach them differently. Um, my next concert involves a lot of uh, contemporary music, and for this one, I really had to dig into the score. It's a very big score. Um, I have it over there. I didn't plan to do this, but it's very impressive. So it's it's huge. Wow. And um, and if you see the writing, it's extremely oh, small. Oh my goodness. Oh, I had a few years of piano lessons, but it's okay. Wow. So these kind of things you need you need I don't know three weeks to just sort of understand what to play, and then you need to practice it. So depending on what kind of pieces are ahead, I try to organize my practice. Yeah, yeah. And some pieces you said uh, require time to consolidate in your head without even playing that much, so they have to age like a cheese. Is it right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, for example, in three weeks, I'm playing the Nielsen Concerto, which is a piece that I, I played a lot. So I, I sort of have a feeling it's like a, it's like a friend. Um, and it's not, it's not going to ask for so much uh, practice. I'm not, I'm not learning the notes anymore, but I'm in this process of, of making it um, a new version of uh, what I want to express now. So it's a very different kind of work. Um, that's, in, that's interesting, since the notes will be the same, right? It's like the, what Nielsen has created. You have to play those notes. But what aspects uh, are there that are free to alter for you? Um, just sort of how I want to contrast the, the different tempi and the different uh, characters in the piece. Um, and I don't know, year after year after year, um, you sort of come back to a passage and realize, oh, actually, I could do it a little bit differently this time. And or something resonates maybe with something else that you've played or something else that you've heard. Um, for example, actually, in the orchestra, a few weeks ago, we played the Briten violin concerto with a wonderful soloist, Clara Kumijong. Kumijong yeah. And um, I enjoyed so much her performance. And the end of the Britain concerto reminded me of one passage of my Nielsen concerto. And I thought, oh, actually, I have a new idea on it now. And I want to develop in this direction. So yeah. it's... Um, so your inspiration comes uh, at, at certain uh, um, unexpected moments and you take it with you. And so it evolves. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Concerto. Yes. Yeah. Do you uh, another question? Do you remember the first time you walked um, from the Rotterdam airport or the train station into the city towards the Doelen? Do you remember the first encounter with Rotterdam? Yes. Um, it's actually a very nice story. But um, I've known Julia Turel, who is my colleague now. I've known her since I'm 16. Because we recorded the CD together called The Master and the Student. And she was the master and I was the student. Uh, you can find the CD on all platforms. Uh, I don't listen to it anymore because uh, I don't like to hear about how I played when I was 16. But uh, at the time, it was a very exciting project for me. And she was sort of, she was always sort of a fairy godmother for me. Um, she was never really my teacher, but I had some. She was kind of a mentor. Yeah. So one time I visited her in Rotterdam. That's the first time that I came to Rotterdam. And I was staying at her house. And she took me to, I think, to see Delft's Haven. And to it's the, the best part of Rotterdam. Yes, it's very I think. nice. Yes. Yeah. And now you're living there. Yes. Yeah, but mostly with a suitcase ready to, to fly to Stockholm and all the other venues you're uh, visiting as a soloist, yes, right? Yes, yes. I try to take the train as much as I can. I prefer train than flying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in Rotterdam, with the Rotterdam Philharmonic Orchestra, um, it's a different role compared to you being a soloist, right? With all different orchestras. Um, how do you f do you feel with the, the, the Rotterdam Philharmonic? Um, is it a place you call home right now? Yes, absolutely. I felt very much at home immediately from the first rehearsal. I felt like this chair is my chair somehow and I still feel like that and I'm 
just very happy. It feels like a family, really. And in the woodwinds, we have a very nice group of extremely kind people who are also very inspiring musicians. So I keep learning every day with them, and I'm just very, very grateful. Wow. And is, is there something very Rotterdamish about the orchestra that you say, ah, this is very distinctive for this orchestra? Is there a Rotterdam sound or behavior? Um, I think the Rotterdam Philharmonic has a magical talent for overcoming um, cer certain stressful situations. For example, uh, stressing uh, difficult travel and we arrive somewhere on tour, we're a little bit tired and there's not enough time with the soloist or the instruments are not arrived in time and we just have a very short uh, sound check or whatever. Um, and during the rehearsal, you always think, oh, we're going to manage this. Is, this is really tricky. And then the orchestra has a magical power that concerts are always better and great and people play at their best with the adrenaline. And I've played a little bit around with different orchestras where that's really not the case. And okay, wow. I've played with orchestras where rehearsals are very nice and then in the concert there's sort of a general pressure that everybody is a little bit less comfortable because of, I don't know, of a certain stress. And then the concert ends up being a little bit less good than the rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And in Rotterdam, very often, and of course, we have sometimes bad surprises, but it, in most cases, I think the orchestra really has a, there's a transformation in the concert. It's always a completely new adventure. Yeah. I would think that someone at the Rotterdam Philharmonic staff creates problems on purpose during <laughs> rehearsals to say, oh, do we have the adrenaline going on? But I don't oh. think that's the case. <laughs> Uh, this would be this would be very uh, very much of a of a film director move like Hitchcock who used to make his actors feel very uncomfortable. No, yeah. but uh, I, I I hope that's not the case with us. I think I don't think. So. Then a, a different question concerning your uh, repertory repertoire. Um, will you will you be playing the guitar concertos by Rodrigo some someday as a soloist? Since you play guitar as well, you told me. Oh. No, I could never play it. Never play that. No, no, no. No, I have um, I have some guitars at home. This is sort of my uh, my hobby uh, that I took as a teenager, and I kept. Uh, yeah, it's sort of my 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 little moment. Sometimes in the evening, I just sit on my couch with my guitars and I sing some songs. I did that a lot during Corona, also. Um. Yes, so I have over there a little collection of, uh, I was telling Sanders earlier, um, of some ukuleles and some guitar and uh, an auto harp also, which is a folk instrument from the from the US. It's sort of a harp that has buttons like an accordion, so you can just tune them with one chord. Uh, you can press the button, it makes a chord, so it's a little bit like harp for dummies, and it's, uh, it's very nice to sing along to. Yeah. Is it in a way refreshing as well to sometimes play a totally different instrument with strings and stuff and that you have to hold your hands differently and then the flute feels like new again? Yes, definitely. And it's sometimes very frustrating to not master something technically when actually you have an idea of how it should sound like, but your, your body cannot do it. Hmm. But that's why I only practice very easy stuff and things I can sing along to, so basically and yeah I'm, I'm not at all i have no ambition with this this is really just for fun just my little moment but you like to sing johnny mitchell uh, don't you i do yes yeah. my uh, my favorite Great. And um, concerning your uh, uh, time as a student with the guitar you mentioned um, how, how was your uh, way to your professional career um, when did you know i want to be a principal flute in Rotterdam. Uh, when did you know I, I was born to play the flute? Um, well, my mom is a piano teacher. And so we had a piano at home and I would just sort of go to the piano and play around a little bit. So very early on, she took me with her to her school and I would spend my days there and listen to everything and just run around in the corridors. And so very early on, I could see all the instruments 
and discover which ones I liked and I fell in love with the flute. So in the beginning I was too short for the bass plate. So I had to do one year of recorder. And then finally I got a, a flute for kids that sort of bend it around. It has a shape, the shape of a, of a yeah, I, I don't know how to explain it. It's bent, it has a, a curve there. And finally, when I was seven, I was allowed to pick up the big flute, which sort of was half of my size. So I was really like, you know. <laughs> um, and then somehow, very naturally, I, I knew I wanted to be a flutist. So I, uh, I entered a school where I had um, uh, the hours were made so that I could continue my academic studies and still have a lot of time to play music next to it. And then Paris Conservatoire, and yeah, it was quite smooth and quite natural, and I just stayed in one in one way. Yeah. Wow! And it was then that you met Juliette Turel uh, as well, or was it later? Yeah, I met her when I was fifteen. Uh, I did a summer course with uh, her husband, who is also a very famous flutist, Benoît Fonge. Um, and at, at the time, she was looking for a young student to play this CD. So she was the master and she needed the student. Um, and then Benoit told her, you should meet this girl that I gave lessons to in this summer course. And so they organized the meeting and that's how we met. It's fascinating. Those musical junctions in your life, you have to meet the right person at the right time. And there you are in yeah. Rotterdam, the best city of the world. Right, people? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I see we're already 20 minutes uh, into uh, the session. Um, we uh, talk uh, uh, later again, uh, Josephine, with uh, Bertie as well. But um, switching to Bertie, I would like to first ask uh, Liana Furman uh, of the ICCR to uh, tell something about this uh, wonderful trajectory in Rotterdam. Can you hear me, uh, Liana? Yeah, yeah. The microphone was uh, was muted. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah. So um, ICCR stands for International Conducting Competition Rotterdam. Um, you might have heard about it already. Um, the first edition took place last year, and uh, Birdie was one of our uh, finalists and winner of the grand uh, grand prize. And as a result, he's now uh, conducting the Rotterdam Philharmonic Orchestra as an assistant conductor. Um, and uh, right now we're preparing the second edition, which was in 2025. So that feels uh, very far away, but for us, it's uh, uh, very soon. The applications uh, are open right now until December 1st. And uh, we're hoping for, um, many candidates again from all over the world. Um, and then we'll invite 24 uh, young conductors to Rotterdam uh, for the semifinals next year in June. And after that, six uh, candidates who come back uh, a year later in 2025 to, uh, to conduct um, four different orchestras um, and the Rotterdam Phil amongst others. Wow. So it's a, uh, it's a long cycle um, and uh, with a lot of preparation for the for the young conductors, which Bertie uh, knows all about. <laughs> and um, it's yeah, it's a dream come uh, true for for a lot of people. To take part in such a beautiful I, uh, thing. Yeah, I would say so. Well, Bertie could probably say more, but the thing that we really enjoy about this whole um, trajectory is that. Um, we really get to know the candidates before they enter the stage uh, for the mm -hmm. final rounds. So we first select them by video, then we invite them to Rotterdam for selections. And then we have a year to um, meet them a couple of times. We invite them to Rotterdam to meet the orchestra, uh, not only the Rotterdam Philharmonic, but also other orchestras. Um, we organize um, interview trainings with one of your uh, colleagues at the radio, Sonder. Um, and um, we make promotional videos and um, yeah, we really 
work together with them and prepare them to uh, um, enter the stage. Um, yeah, well prepared. Yeah, it's a very thorough process, which involves your total life. Uh, you dedicate your life to the ICCR, uh, basically for like one, two years. <laughs> but yeah, maybe so I should ask years. Bertie that yeah. in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Uh, and and, and um, how can we uh, apply for, the, for, uh, uh, for an audition with the ICCR? Uh, well, I think most of you in this uh, meeting are a little bit too old. <laughs> the applications are open for all conductors uh, between uh, 23 and 30. Um, and uh, uh, well, we ask for uh, for videos, uh, for program proposals, and well, for your whole resume, mm. uh, all the experience. So um, yeah, it, it's very interesting to see the where from which part of the world people are applying from and um, also the experience that the young conductors already have. And hmm. um, yeah, so we're very uh, curious uh, until December 1st, uh, how many uh, conductors uh, there will be. Last time we had 165 applications. Wow. Yeah, so, um, and we hear from other colleagues, other competitions, sometimes, there are over 300 or 400 applications. So oh, fingers booming, crossed. Booming business. Yeah. <laughs> I wish you yep. lots of lots of joy with uh, uh, looking through all these uh, applicants and uh, have, have a great time uh, ahead. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Fortunately, I... we have a very wise jury who will go through all the applications. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's not only me. Thank you so much, uh, Leon and Furman. Um, Thanks. So, Bertie, uh, you came from the UK uh, to Rotterdam for this competition. Uh, how nervous were you? Well, it's a good question. Um, well, I think it's it's interesting because, as Leana describes, the the Rotterdam competition is sort of completely different from any other conducting competition I'd done. So, I I think I'd done three or four competitions before. And I think in a way you you can persuade yourself you're not really nervous if you've, you know, you kind of, you know what it feels like to be in a competition. And even if you are nervous, you could be used to that. So it's not, it's not sort of so scary. I think the really nice thing about Rotterdam was as soon as I got onto the stage with the Rotterdam Philharmonic, the first thing I was conducting was part of Carmen. Um, and immediately, um, you felt actually that the orchestra was enthusiastic and and excited to be there. And that really does change things for a conductor in an audition that often in these competitions is it's very hard work, I think, for orchestras because they have, you know, maybe 30 conductors in a day and you play the same piece 30 times and, you know, you have 10 minutes on it with each conductor. So I can imagine it's really tiring for orchestras. Um, how, the, how should how should it compare? Is it like an, uh, an engine of a taxi that is already uh, uh, on temperature and the taxi has been driving all day with constantly new passengers, you being the conductors? Or do you feel like the orchestra is constantly uh, starting with a clean uh, sheet and then inviting you to give your personality to them again and again? Well, yeah, I mean, often, unfortunately, it's like the taxi. But in the case of Rotterdam, it was very much that there was a kind of clean sheet in that... As you say, we could go and just work as if it was a concert. And that's a really nice position to be in because then, you know, you're not kind of putting on a show for a, for an audition to, to kind of act a little bit. But instead, you can just be honest and be a musician and work with the orchestra as you would in any other context. And that, I think, is probably the way you show the best of yourself. But it's certainly the most enjoyable way for you and the orchestra and I think also the audience as well. Um, that you get um, you get a really good sense of the conductor, the orchestra, and the music too. Yeah, yeah. But you yourself, you you needed to make this like this mental switch, being uh, someone born in nineteen ninety five, standing in front of an orchestra with all these amazingly talented musicians, maybe uh, in their forties, fifties, sixties. Um, isn't that difficult or overwhelming sometimes? Yeah, I mean, it, it's something you always have to think about, and I think. 
you know, however old the the individual players are, I think the one thing you really have to respect is that an orchestra as a whole has played all of the core repertoire many, many more times than I've conducted it. Um, and I think you, you're you very foolish. I think if you go into an orchestra and you think, oh no, that doesn't matter, I know how I do it. So I think one of the things that's really important to learn as a conductor is that, of course, you have to prepare and you have to have your own ideas, your own interpretation, your own phrasing and shaping. But actually the first thing you have to do when you get to the orchestra is just listen and you know see what comes back to you. And you might instantly think, oh, that is amazing. I, I'd never thought it could sound like that, but I really like it. And then you can work with that and you can sort of properly collaborate um, with the orchestra. And I think if you if you forget to listen and you just think that you want to go in straight away and change things, then I think you miss out on an opportunity of being able to um, reach a new musical level with an orchestra. Yeah. But then again, in a competition, people are looking at you like, what's he about to offer to us? They want to you to, to teach them something instead of you just listening to what, what they make of a top hit like Carmen already because they played it uh, dozens of times and they know how it can sound and they're enthusiastic about it. But there, you have to find your own way, right? Between listening and directing, being the manager. Yeah, it's a balance, I think. Um, and there are some things, of course, that you might have as a priority that you're really for you is really important. And it might be that a particular rhythm is played in a particular way or that the balance is in a certain way so that one instrument is, you know, really prioritized. Um, but yeah, I think finding that balance between, you know, putting your own ideas into practice and also respecting the orchestra's ideas, listening to what they offer. And the other thing to remember is that, let's say particularly in the case of an orchestra like the Rotterdam Philharmonic or any great orchestra, many great conductors have conducted the orchestra book in the past. So the the sound that the orchestra makes will be partly their own sound, of course, and partly their own players. But also there's often there's kind of like a memory of another conductor who's who's played there and conducted it in the past. And so I think, you know, you never know who's there. There's a lovely story actually about um, uh, a, a young conductor. And I think it was actually, it was a, an orchestra in Austria he was conducting and he, he said, oh, something or other, you know, this bar wasn't together. And one of the, the um, orchestral musicians put his hand up and said, oh, yes, but with Carlos Kleiber last week, it was together. So I think, um, you know, you've got to be careful um, and, and make sure that you you do listen and you do properly think about how you can work together with the orchestra. Yeah. And each orchestra having its own DNA, right? Um, you have to respect that as well. Mm. Uh, how would you compare Rotterdam to other orchestras you've worked with? Is there a Rotterdam sound or do you say like it's a mentality or how would you describe yeah. the orchestra? It's um, it's an interesting question. And, and as I travel around more and conduct more orchestras, it's nice to hear different sounds of different orchestras. So actually at the moment I'm in Tampere in Finland and conducting the orchestra here. We just had our first concert this afternoon. Um, and that they certainly have a very distinctive sound, actually, I would say. It's it's not a sound I've come across before. And I've never worked in Finland before. And I think an orchestra's sound is partly just, of course, the sum of the players in the orchestra, but it's also the hall. And it's also the conductors and musicians who've worked with the orchestra in the past who might have a particular um a particular priority. And I suppose we can all think of you know, say Carrie Anne with the Berlin Phil, um, who had this incredible legato and mm. everything. You could just tell it was Carrie Anne. It's conducting. a signature of sound, right? Exactly, and that, that you know that's an extreme example. Um, and I would say in Rotterdam, there's a, a an enormous energy, and I think Josephine mentioned this as well. There's a great energy in the orchestra, also in in the hall. It's a lovely place to play. You can hear yourself pretty clearly, um, which which makes things. Uh, very focused so you can dive into details and you can you can properly kind of listen across the hall and the place I used to work in America um, unfortunately the concert hall itself wasn't nearly so good to play in it was actually very difficult and so that kind of meant that the sound of the orchestra was a bit more um, 
it, it was less kind of blended than you know many other orchestras say rotterdam because it was just really hard to hear bad, bad acoustics but, yeah exactly and and I, I think um you know having a good hall is essential but of course the people in the orchestra having that energy and having that willingness to play together is is even more essential Hmm. So energy might be the, the central uh, uh, thing here. Uh, in, uh, when you want to succeed as an orchestra with a performance, the energy has to be right. And then surrounding aspects, they come second or third place. Hmm. Yeah. And I think when we say energy, we don't just mean playing everything with a lot of kind of, um, you know, this sort of energy. It can also be, we you know, just the sense that an orchestra, they have a connection between each other as people. Um, and that they're not just, you know, a violin and a flute, but they're actually people who know each other and that they can trust each other. And ultimately, you hope that a conductor can also trust the orchestra and vice versa. Um, and I think that's the sort of energy that's really important. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like the energy in the slow part of Mahler's Ninth Symphony, where you can hear a needle drop and then mm. everyone is... Uh, connected in the orchestra yeah that, that's magic is that mm -hmm. something you strive for every performance or do you know uh, that um, such a synchronicity is something that is not forcibly achieved yeah it's it, it's tricky i think that that kind of feeling of let's say magic or, or electricity whatever you want to call it i don't think that's something you can you can create consciously you know, if you're lucky, everything will line up and then you'll get it. But I think if you try and um, if you try and aim for that, then you probably won't end up with with the right thing. Because I think that that magic is a combination of a lot of other factors, all just, you know, aligning and being just right. And when it happens, it's wonderful. And we've all felt that when, you know, as you say, you could hear a pin drop or it could be a huge climax where it just feels completely you know um in unison in the whole orchestra hmm. um so yeah. yeah i think i think you have to hope for that you have to hope for that it's it can sound like pseudo science right um that's certain something that you can't be taught at the uh, royal academy of music or i don't know where you study so studies um yeah, how, yeah. Uh, is, is that something that has to mature with yourself as well in your career as a, a, a conductor how to find your own piece in letting the orchestra and, and the moments grab that magic? Yeah, I think um, one thing I realize actually, as I work more as a conductor, is that, um, well, so you, you mentioned the Royal Academy of Music, um, which is is where I did my masters. And I had a wonderful teacher there called Sean Edwards, who was a brilliant musician and she was a wonderful teacher too. But a lot of our focus, um, on on conducting at the academy was very much on a kind of technical um level of you know how can you show as much as possible with your hands and with your baton and how can you communicate as much as possible that way and that's very important and i think you know music colleges obviously should teach that as they should teach piano technique or, or anything else you need that but i think now i you know spend all of my time working and traveling and conducting I realize actually that one of the things which is most important and probably um, is more significant than, than your technique is how your personality kind of expresses itself in a rehearsal. And it's funny, we you see wonderful conductors sometimes and they have terrible hand technique and, you know, it, it somehow things can work and, and orchestras can play together and they can sound beautiful, even though the person conducting doesn't really show very much with their hands. And sometimes even, you know, being honest, the, the person can be a hindrance rather than a help. But nonetheless, they they get something out of the orchestra. And I think that's because they have such a strong musical personality. And that may be because they were a great performer themselves. And there's a kind of respect that, that comes with that. Maybe because they were like a, a scholar or a historian and that they just have so much knowledge that that kind of comes out or it could just be that they have a kind of personality that makes them very open and very communicative yeah. and I think in a way it's hard to say 
what that is, but undoubtedly that exists. And I think it's that's so the fascinating thing. what you're what you're mentioning, since um, Bernard Heiting, the Dutch com uh, conductor, had the same thing going on when he uh, entered the stage and approached the orchestra. The, 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 all of us in the audience felt something special and you saw uh, the musicians feel it too. Mm. He didn't say a word. He didn't look at it in, a, in a strange way. It was that something you you're mentioning right now is is a respect that someone has that makes the orchestra sound even better. It, that's a fascinating side of your your job. Yeah, and I, I think um that that's kind of why, as Josephine was saying earlier, some pieces you need to kind of let them sit a little bit and um and not not work on them actively, but just let them kind of filter into your body and. You know, sometimes I think the pieces that we perform best are the pieces we learned a long time ago, but we never actually performed. And they've kind of had years just to sort of sit and for you to gain experience in life and in music. And then you come back to them and you know the basics of the piece, but you have a sort of fresh perspective. And then I think that really helps um, you feel comfortable with the piece, but also it helps you be able to send it out into the orchestra and, and really communicate what you'd like. Wow. Um, and there are also uh, pieces of music for the organ that have been filtering and sitting inside your musical memory for some time, since you're you're an organist as well, right? Organ scholar. Yeah, I was. When, when I was at university, I used to play the organ um, in the, the college chapel. And um, so, yeah, four or five times a week, I would, would play the organ with the choir there. So that was kind of my, um, uh, well, I mean, although I don't play the organ anymore, I found that experience really, really important because every time we had a service in the chapel, you have to perform something. And, you know, this is five times a week that you have, you know, a very short performance, but nonetheless, you have to get into that habit of learning and performing. And I think it helps a great deal, uh, as Josephine was saying, with that preparation, but also with being comfortable with performing and, and you know, not um not not feeling that uh you have to sort of exhaust yourself with each performance i think you know you can of course and you should sometimes really give everything in a performance but sometimes for instance when you're rehearsing you do want to have the sense of playing a piece all the way through to practice certain things but you you can't because maybe you've got to play it later that evening you can't exhaust yourself playing it so that habit's also quite a useful one i think that, that that i learned from that experience playing the organ yeah yeah yeah. and um i've heard that the british organists are the most flawless players uh very well trained <laughs> so good for you well and, was... no longer, but... <laughs> and, and it was another instrument right when you were even younger uh age four you played the uh yeah i began with the cello um it was my first instrument and i still love playing the cello actually i, I never play it in public because you wouldn't want to hear me but um, it's, I think it's a very beautiful instrument, the cello, and um, it's still in a way, I, I like to to play the cello and the piano sometimes just to, to remind myself that actually, you know, what it feels like making music where you make the noise yourself. Whereas when you conduct, of course, you, you do make music, but it's a, such a different feeling. So I think it's good to come back to actually making noise sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um Maybe when you're uh, conducting Saint-Saëns' Third Symphony or, or, or a piece with a prominent cello uh, uh, thing that, that you're thinking of yourself playing that instrument, but then you have to keep the distance being a conductor and trust those soloists for their, um, um, their quality. They're much better than I am, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we can uh, um, talk with uh, uh, Josephine as well, the three of us. Uh, since Josephine... Um, Bertie just mentioned being comfortable uh, giving concerts, uh, being comfortable on stage. Um, is that like a, w a walk in the park for you, giving concerts? Um, it depends what you call a walk in the park. Um, I like to think that it's always nice to have some sort of um, very tiny nervousness. I think if you're if you're completely without excitement before playing, then I think it's a sh it's a shame. Um, and usually when I do feel nervous, I tell myself 
that's good. It's good that I feel nervous. Of course, it might hinder my playing in a way, but at least it means I'm there, I care, and I'm going to be focused and I'm going to give my best. So, of course, then it's uh, it's uh, it's about how nervous you are. Sometimes too nervous can be too nervous. And I'm, I'm just thinking, because Ken told me my sound was bad. Is it okay now? I it's much better. It's oh, much sorry. better. Yeah. Uh, but maybe you recognize the, ner the nervous level when you um, have this out-of-body experience that you're thinking of yourself, I'm on stage now. It's Rotterdam. It's Thursday night. Where am I? Uh, do I have to play... Uh, <laughs> You know, that's, that's wrong, yeah. right? If you're so nervous that you're observing yourself. Yes. Um... I think though sometimes, you know, you can find the best performances. You sort of, um, you go into a kind of flow and you forget that you're performing. And then at the end, you, you realize, oh, yes. here I am. I've just done the concert. So it's a fine line, I think, between them. Yeah. How are you being taught at the uh, conservatory uh, to deal with... Um the mental aspects of performing the pressure it can can bring with it and staying focused is there a, like a psychological course in in the conservatories we had this thing at the royal academy called um alexander technique i don't know if you have it in the netherlands um and actually to be honest it, it wasn't offered for conductors so i don't really know what it is either but um for singers and some performers they had this this technique that they were taught. But I think it's a very personal thing. You know, um, some people um, get very, very nervous and they have all sorts of strategies for dealing with it. And some people don't get very nervous at all. Um, I heard um, the conductor, Roger Norrington, um, who's a very famous conductor, of course, um, very old now. And he apparently used to get quite nervous, but then he started before every concert, he'd have a large steak and a bottle of red wine. And that would um, stop him getting nervous, apparently. So. Yeah, so there's a trick for everything. Sibelius also liked to drink uh, lots of wine before a concert. So, okay. Really? Yeah. But uh, Josephine, what's your feeling in Rotterdam? Uh, uh, working for the orchestra, is there um, someone who monitors your well-being as a musician that you can speak to in some some frequent moments? Um, well, I, and there's no mental coach per se. I think there are resources if people have really a stress problem. I think there's people they can turn to. But um, it's a little bit of a taboo, I have to say, not in, in this particular orchestra, but in, in general, I think. Mm -hmm. um, dealing with pressure, dealing with burnout is something that uh, as musicians, we're not really prepared, actually. Um, but there's more and more things that exist. Um, and I myself started to work with a mental coach this year. Mm. And uh, it's actually a whole science what you can do with just training your, your concentration and how to approach a situation. It's really close to what uh, sportsmen are doing um, about how to accomplish your task in a, in a given moment without, with as little as possible negative thoughts and just uh, focusing on, on exactly what you have to do and having a plan. Yeah. And um, yeah. Because it's exactly this that I wanted to mention as well. It's like Olympic uh, level that you're uh, playing at, uh, conducting, uh, being a solo flute player. Um, sportsmen know how to properly warm themselves up and cool down and uh, manage their energy levels during a week with trainings and uh, uh, sport events. Isn't that lacking a bit in the, in the professional music world? Uh, to, to care for yourself, to, to, to know yes. how you... Okay. Absolutely. Yes, it's lacking. We also, usually the only moment where you start worrying about how you take care of your body is when you start having pain. Um, right. I'm, I'm, a little, I'm lucky I don't have pain, uh, but it can, it can happen in busy periods where you suddenly play a lot that you have pain and you realize, yeah, actually I'm putting my body through too much and my body is not prepared. And usually it's at this moment that uh, that you start worrying about sports, about um, whatever, massage, uh, seeing a physiotherapist. Uh, Alexander Technique is also actually is doing quite some miracles. Mm -hmm. 
I did a little bit myself and I, I have a lot of colleagues and friends who, who are using this technique and it's, it seems to be really working for them. That's, that's great. And I, I, I suspect you tell each other in the orchestra as well with a good experience, right? If, if you're telling about a mental coach, uh, I think the, the whole orchestra uh, has uh, beneficial effects from these kind of supports, right? It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think there's actually we are lucky to be to be um, fixed members of an orchestra because if if today I have pain and I cannot play, I am not worried to lose my job. But I think it's been a big taboo because freelance musicians, they cannot speak about, for example, having tendinitis, you know, when you're inflammated and you actually have pain when you play and you should really stop playing. But if you stop playing, then you lose gigs and you lose money and then it's a, it's a huge thing. So. Uh, but luckily, I think even now for freelance musicians, there's more and more support and awareness and because these things can happen and it's just, uh, it's important to prevent them and to yeah to take care of our bodies and our minds as well. Yeah. And Bertie, does it sound familiar to you as well, what Josephine describes? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting. And, and as you say, Josephine, everyone maybe finds their own way of, of dealing with problems and and hopefully dealing in advance with with any pain or anything that comes up. Um, I find actually what I eat really um, affects how how you feel. So for me, actually, in my sort of little ritual, I always have a banana before the start of a rehearsal or a or a concert. It's very good food. It kind of it also has uh, beta blockers. Eh? A banana. It's uh, oh, okay. uh, you call it beta oh, yeah? blockers in Dutch. Yeah, really. The secret remedy when you're about to go on stage, eat a banana, mm -hmm. and then in half an hour it will deliver. It's Awesome effects. So no, they're, yeah. very, they're amazing things, bananas, actually. So um, that's, uh, yeah. But also, I think, you know, it's very simple things like drinking enough water. Like when I was, um, uh, I, I said I used to work in America and I used to work in, in Colorado, um, where it's very dry, the climate. And it's also um, because of the the altitude. It's about a mile above sea level. It's also there's there's noticeably less oxygen in the air. And I remember when I went for my audition, I conducted, you know, for 10 minutes or something, and I stopped to say something, and I was just so short of breath, I couldn't say anything. <laughs> and I, you know, you get into the habit of breathing properly, um, finding a way of speaking in a big orchestra room so that you don't um, yeah. hurt your voice, even though you have to be able to make sure everyone can hear you. So, you know, drinking enough water and just speaking sensibly, um, all those sorts of things. Yeah, you don't, you don't get taught them, I don't think. Or I wasn't Josephine. Um, so you have to find them out maybe to yourself and from, from colleagues. Yeah. yeah. So you have to be aware of virtually every aspect of your life in, in the jobs you're having, right? To, to be able to perform at maximum level, you need to constantly stay focused. On what, yeah. what do I eat? How many sleep did I have last night? Did I shout too much? Yeah, it's true. And also, this can be one of the difficult things about being on tour, that you can be certain, suddenly in a country where you don't know the food, uh, you can be jet-lagged, you can uh, have traveled for three hours in a bus, and still you have to play at your best in the evening. So that's, uh, that's one of the... And we are very lucky that we get to travel and see these beautiful places and play in these beautiful halls. But... It's also it's also very demanding and tiring, and um, we have to learn to navigate that as well. Yeah, and uh, having to wait at airports for train stations. Um, do yeah. you often like to listen to long pieces of music uh, to pass time, or study uh, your uh, uh, scores, sheet music? I actually, I I really don't like listening to music when I'm traveling. I have to say because almost always you can hear the train or the plane or the bus. And you, you get such a, a a degraded quality of sound, I think, that I, I actually really don't like doing that. I try not to. I um I normally actually tend to read on long journeys um because I, I love to read, but I never have any time for it when I'm not traveling. So I think when I travel, that's that's my sort of uh, what, what 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 do you read? All sorts of things, actually. I'm reading um this sounds very silly. I'm reading a book at the moment about the history of um cricket. Okay. Anyway, uh, so actually it's it's funny so cricket is one of my my biggest hobbies outside music and in fact just today actually the netherlands was playing england in the cricket world cup um and as england won today but actually the netherlands are going to come out above england i think in the world wow. cup. good for them um 
anyway, so so that's you know that's um one one of the things I'm reading at the moment. Great, and you, and you Josephine? Me, um, when I travel, my my new passion is to knit. I'm knitting a lot, and to listen to podcasts. So um, I'm actually enjoying. I'm looking forward to traveling. I have in a few weeks. I have a train journey of seven hours, and I'm almost looking forward to it because I will be uh, for six hours knitting and listening to my podcast. So you can binge podcast an entire series of uh, some 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 scary yeah. story about a murder, and you can knit entire. Uh, yeah, I don't know what you're knitting. <laughs> for example, sweaters or yeah, yeah. Wow, great, Amazing. great, great. Uh, one uh, last question I'd like to ask the both of you. Uh, you're both young. Uh, you're in your twenties. Um, how do you look uh, towards the future of classical music, uh, the domain of music we're working in? Uh, me myself at the radio, but you on stage. Yeah, how, how do you see awesome. classical music and their audiences in the in the near future? Well, I think um, I I know we always well certainly in England, but everyone always seems to talk about how classical music is you know about to be about to die and that no one will come and listen to it. But actually, I think that's probably not true. I think you know for hundreds of years. <laughs> come to classical music because it offers something that other other parts of your life doesn't offer. And even if you love other, other parts of culture, you know, art or, or books or poetry or whatever, you know, music still offers something different. And I think it's it, it always will. So I think as long as people are people, I think there'll be an audience for it. And to be honest, I think orchestras now are, are much, much better at trying to engage younger people than they were 10 or 20 years ago. I don't know what you think, Josephine, but it certainly seems that people are making a lot more effort. Yes, I, I was going to to add that I, I very often like to invite people that have never listened to, to a classical concert. And usually I give, I give them the few ticket, the first tickets for free um, because um, I just want, I really want them to come. And usually they always ask me for more tickets. And, and I've, I've invited so far, I've invited the the people from the dry cleaners uh, place in my street. I've invited my driving instructor. <laughs> I've invited people who, who are really not listening to classical music. And um, and very, like the, the reaction is always very enthusiastic. So, And, and do you think about what concert you invite them to, like uh, Ligeti or Brahms uh, for a symphony? Yes, I, I pick very carefully I usually start with a Mahler symphony or something very impressive, um, and then I then we get to the hardest stuff. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gradually, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Towards the Parnassus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you think uh, about the film music? Uh, because that's the way uh, new audiences arrive at the concert hall, and maybe they they can make the leap from uh, John Williams to Gustav Holst or Stravinsky or Mahler. Uh, do you say like no film music? That's not not our domain. Well, actually, I'm conducting some film music this week. Um, in fact, just today. And, and I think, actually, it was done in, in Rotterdam quite recently. This is the Vertigo Suite. Um, and, I, and I think it was a, a month ago or something. Um, yeah. maybe, maybe some of the audience heard it. Um, and it, it's for a film. Um, it's incredibly passionate and dramatic music. Um, so I think, you know, anything that gets people into a concert hall is 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 a good thing. And I think you know, just being, I think the worst thing that we can do is to sort of try and, um, you know, simplify classical music for people. But I think actually we should just be honest and say, well, actually, this music will help you understand and help you feel emotions that there actually aren't words for. And there's a there's a lovely um, uh, quotation from, from um, I think it's, it's uh, it was a reviewer of the, the Ninth Symphony from Beethoven, and it said something like, um, well, where music, oh, sorry, where words can go no further, then music begins. And I think that's that's basically it. And, you know, that's, we just have to persuade people and tell people and be honest with them. Say, well, this is what you'll feel. And I think what you do, Josephine, that sounds like a, a wonderful idea to bring people in. Yeah. I'd like to take driving lessons again to be able to invite my driving instructor. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great thing to do. 
But the thing is as well, um, whenever we play film music on the, the Dutch classical radio, we always get these um, hateful reactions of people that say that there is no place for that on, on this channel. Mm. Um, can you pr provide me with some uh, reasons why that sh should be getting its place next to opera and chamber music and symphonies? Why like, should we? Why should why should we open ourselves to the broader genres and maybe also crossover concerts with uh, a pop singer in front of the orchestra? Well, I think in the case of film music, one of the, the the most powerful arguments is that a lot of composers that we think of as very serious composers also wrote film music. You know, Shostakovich, Britten, William Walton, um, Corn Gold, so on. Um, and so I think you know if it was if it was good enough for you know Benjamin Britten, it's it's probably good enough for for me as well. So I think that's um uh th that's probably what I would say to them. Um, what how do you feel, Josephine? Yeah, I think like also when you listen to a piece of music, automatically because nowadays everybody watches films. So when you listen to a symphony, everybody gets their own images. Um, and we make we create our own film and it's actually so interesting how if two two thousand people in the hall uh create their own film it would be interesting to compare what what people see and and or maybe not everybody has a visual but it can happen that you suddenly think oh this makes me think of uh, reaching the top of a mountain and, and probably this is also from the films you've watched and um and so i i think it's it's a uh, it's not necessary to to separate that. I think imagination is is um, is working like this. So yeah. so I don't I don't see a reason to to forbid ourselves to to listen to film music. So we should keep on providing this uh, this place where our imagination can run freely during a, a symphony, which is not being simplified, but it's being brought in its entirety, like it's yes. being being composed. I think also there is this idea that, um, of course, when you go to a classical concert, you have to remain silent, you have to remain still. Um, but I'm not when I'm performing. I'm not expecting the audience to to be in a concentration mode that they are watching my every note. I hope that they go into a mode of of their own worlds and their own emotions. Uh, I hope that I can bring them to a state of of actually losing themselves a little bit. Um, I, 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 yeah, that's how, at least that's how I feel during concerts. And it also happens that I go to listen to a concert and I feel so good there. And it can happen that I fall asleep and, and, you know, it can be, it can be in the beginning, I felt shameful, but now I'm just thinking, oh, actually, it means I was feeling good. And that's the, the best thing I can wish for an audience member also. Of course, yeah. I prefer if they, if they actually remember what happened. But, um, but it's, I think it's very normal to go off into imagining things and it can go to very dark places also yeah, yeah. Um, to very deep dark emotions and that's that's also beautiful and like Bertie was saying that sometimes it's difficult to to phrase emotions or to put words on some difficult feelings and and then you listen to a piece of music that will resonate in you in a in a way that you can't express so that's very that's one of the most beautiful things about what we do yeah it surely is one final question, uh, Bertie. Uh, you, of course, being the conductor, can play with the timing when the first bravo shouter can can shout bravo by lowering your hands and, and make this little note. Is that something you uh, enjoy doing? That that final second of a performance. Yeah, it's it's funny, isn't it? How sometimes you you hold the moment at the end of a piece, and sometimes as soon as the music finishes, you want people to applaud and shout out i guess it depends on the piece um but i do think the endings of pieces are are really important and and i was thinking actually the other day that you know obviously a lot of pieces end very loudly and also quite a lot of pieces kind of end completely silently but not that many pieces end sort of quietly and it, i was thinking about this because in this program i'm doing this this week there's only one loud ending. Everything else is quiet, but not silent. So it's it's a kind of interesting feel. And I think helping the audience gradually relax is, is kind of part of the performance too. Thank you about, so much. About that, there's is it a myth, Bertie, that some pieces are more or less played 
um, because of how they end and conductors want to have the, the triumphant endings. Like if they come as a guest conductor, they want the audience to be really happy at the end. And oh, so yeah. for example, if you take Brahms symphonies, I think this, the first, uh, the third and second are a little bit less. Is that is that true? Yeah, the Brahms third symphony is is supposedly also orchestra managers don't like programming it because all of the movements end quietly. Mm. Um, and so it's, you finish your concert and you it's mezzo piano and it doesn't quite finish in the way like Brahms four does or Brahms one. Mm. Um, so I think that is true. And, and certainly, you know, some conductors have different styles. Of course, some people are, you know, you think of someone like Gustavo Dudamel, for instance, he's such an energetic conductor and finishing a piece like a Mahler symphony or something like that, you know, he does that so well. And then other conductors, you mentioned Bernard Heitink, you know, can really control a beautiful, quiet, serene ending. Um, so I think, you know, it's your personality as well. No, yeah, yeah. But it is true, I think. that. that... Mm. And maybe Tchaikovsky should have uh, exchanged the uh, parts three and four of his uh, Pathetic Symphony, right? I played him on the radio. After uh, part, <laughs> part three, everyone <laughs> starts clapping, but then yeah. you have this uh, dying away in part four. <laughs> but okay. I won't uh, touch that masterpiece. Uh, but I was uh, uh, wrapping up since it's four past nine in the evening. Uh, thank you so much for these beautiful insights. It's it's always a pleasure to to pick your brains and with your experience. Wishing you both great luck in your musical careers, thank and you. I hope you're ready thank for you. some uh, for some questions uh, from the audience, uh, Mr. Buvalda. Yes, I uh, got questions from the audience. The first and uh, question is from Minika uh, for Josephine. What do you prefer, playing on an orchestra, in an orchestra, or as a soloist? Um, that's very interesting because I think in the end, I, it should be the same approach. It's just playing music. Um, the the interesting thing I actually read this about a, a jazz musician who said, when I improvise, when when I'm playing with a group and I'm improvising, the first thing I'm doing is listening. And then imagining if I needed a guitar there, what what would I would what would I like to hear? And then I play that. And and I re I realize that's true for us as well. When you play your part, it's always just sort of complementing what's around. And so in the orchestra, I'm maybe two percent of what's happening on stage. Yeah. And when you play as a soloist, you're maybe more like. 50% or even sometimes you play a, a piece for solo flute, you're 100%. So it's just about how much you get to shape what's, what's happening. Um, so I can't really say I have a preference. Um, yeah, okay, may, maybe if I, had, if I had to live without one or the other, I would prefer to stay in the orchestra. That's my answer. Okay. Uh, second question also for Josephine. What's your role in the Rotterdam Philharmonic together with Juliette? Are you playing alternately with her or how how are you doing? So we have actually the same position called the uh, principal foot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that means we both alt alternate. So there's always a moment, usually in April, where we look at the season, the upcoming season, and we decide who plays what. Uh, only there are some very fun weeks where it's very special in our contracts. There are some weeks where we actually both have to play. This usually happens with the big Mahler symphonies, for example, especially on tour with uh, with big conductors like La Havre or uh, Yannick. Uh, so there we, we switch. We sort of make it even who plays first flute, who plays in the group, and um, we keep alternating like this. Yeah. yeah okay. Then I have a question for Bertie. Uh, you are an assistant conductor. What's your role at, uh, at this year? I mean, you will conduct special concerts and you will lead the rehearsals or do you doing pre-rehearsals? What's what's your role? Yeah, so when when I was the assistant um, for Lahav last year, you would, uh, when he was conducting a, a concert, so say for instance, uh, I was there when he did the Heldenleben, um, which you probably, I think you were playing Josephine, um, yes. and um, it was a, a very big concert in January. And as the assistant, you have to uh, sit in the rehearsals and be in the hall, and you have to 
make notes and and give feedback on how the the sounds the balance of the orchestra sounds from the audience because when you're on the podium in the orchestra it sounds very different or it can sound very different um and particularly if you have a soloist you have to make sure that you can hear the soloist and that the orchestra is not too loud and so you're kind of like the conductor's um their sort of second pair of ears in the concert hall okay uh, we have an in holland we have a word in zeepen uh, uh, a symphony in zeepen with the orchestra i don't know the english word uh, sander or ken do you know what it is hey, do, uh, before before the first hey, rehearsal no. with the conductor ah, like hey. like a preparation rehearsal yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. yeah do you do that um i haven't in rotterdam for for that some orchestras okay. um will do that and some orchestras won't so it sort of depends on the the context really um, okay. but um yeah it, it, it's sometimes also a preference like some conductors want to do all of their own rehearsals and some want to you know be somewhere else and you know then come in for the last few rehearsals it's more common actually in opera i think that you have that where you have um you know normally in an opera you have like four or five weeks of rehearsals and so sometimes you have an assistant conductor who does three weeks and then the main conductor comes in for the last the last week okay uh, then i have a question for josephine can you talk about your instrument and how finding an instrument is that different from strings versus winds yes um so I play the same instrument for 13 years now. Um, it's a silver flute from the Japanese brand Muramatsu. And I am currently trying out some, some other flutes because a flute, not like a violin or a cello, um, cannot be played for so many years. It has sort of an expiration date. Uh, of course, because the mechanisms are getting old. Um, so you can always, I take very good care of it, but after 13 years, I can feel that maybe it's time for a new instrument. Um, but it's, it's difficult to find and, um, the search is, is always tricky because with flute, it's really not like with strings. So it's not like you can suddenly find the, from one instrument to another, just, um, completely particular instrument. We have brands that make models. Uh, usually they are built in factories and they are the same. Um, and so far I've tried all brands and I've tried most models of all these brands and I haven't found a flute that sounds, that I prefer than, than my flute. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, um, I will keep trying, keep looking. Or you can establish your own brand, of course. It might be a business yeah. model, right? <laughs> yeah, or I can uh, I can just keep playing on my old instrument, and if it if it still feels comfortable, then why not? Yeah. No, why not? And you hope you will uh, stay with that instrument for many years. Let's hope. Let's hope. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, another question for you: uh, What has it meant for you solo career that you won the Nielsen competition? Um, it meant a great deal. It was really a um, stepping stone. I've I've had way more concerts since then, and I've had the management since then. Um, of course, as a flutist, um, the solo career of a flutist will never be as um, as uh, busy as the solo career of a of a violin player or a pianist, because there's a little bit less repertoire, and orchestras tend to program less flutes than they program violins, which is of course connected to how much repertoire there is. Um, but yeah, Nielsen competition was definitely uh, the step into into that direction of my career. Okay. The uh, next question is for Bertie. How would you characterize the differences between the audiences in the various countries where you will you've conducted, <laughs> such as UK, UK, US, Finland, and the Netherlands? That's a very good question. Um, yeah. I the the Netherlands is a very enthusiastic audience in general and you know you see often the audience will stand up at the end of a concert 
and um, you feel that the audience is is both enthusiastic and very knowledgeable. Um, in America, it's funny because they're very enthusiastic, but I think, um, with apologies, Ken, they're probably not so knowledgeable as the, <laughs> the Netherlands <laughs> audience. Um, but um, but they're very enthusiastic as well. Um, in Finland, I mean, just from this concert this afternoon, um, they were very polite, I would say. Um, maybe that's what you'd expect, that it was, it, it, to be fair, it was um, it was like a, a special concert with with members of the town council only. So there was only 100 people or something. And we have the main concert on Friday, which is 2,000 people. So it'll be good to see see what that is on, on Friday. Maybe, maybe in the future you can conduct on the last night of the Bronx and then it's another audience, I think. <laughs> There's a different audience. <laughs> yeah. I think that would be very scary, actually, because there are so many traditions that if you break one of the rules, you yeah. know, so many people will be angry with you. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that will be, well, maybe, maybe for the future. Yeah. What does your dream career look like? For me? Yes, for you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question. And and I think, in a way, maybe you can try and plan too much. It can be dangerous. Um, but I think that ultimately, uh, I, I was saying to Sander earlier as well, I think it's quite important for conductors to um, do something else as well as conducting. And, you know, some conductors are great soloists and some are writers um and you know in my case i compose music as well and um, and so i think it, it's good to have another side to your musical community, so that you can have a uh just be a more rounded musician so I, I really hope in my career i can continue composing as well alongside yeah. conducting and i do love the travel as josephine says i think every conductor probably wants to find an orchestra where they feel that they're at home and that they trust the orchestra, the orchestra trusts them and that they feel they can kind of establish themselves in a place and that they can be a musician, but also just be part of that city, that that town or community. And I think that's probably a very hard thing to find because to be honest, I think a lot of conductors travel around too much and that they don't kind of stay in one place and really focus on one orchestra or one city enough so that would be my my dream career okay so also as a composer <clears throat> yeah okay uh, for uh, josephine uh, you mentioned already you mentioned already the your instrument eh? uh, for an oboe there is a difference between a, a german and a french oboe is the same uh, like uh, with, with the flute? That's also a very good question. Um, no, the flute is the luckiest of all the woodwinds because we can play everywhere. Um, oboes have differences. Uh, clarinets, there's also the German clarinet, the French clarinet. There is even the Dutch clarinet, actually. Oh, wow. um, uh, also, but orchestras in, in Holland are open to more systems. But for example, if you play uh, Viennese oboe, you can only have a career in Austria. You can never play it in any other country. Um, and bassoons, there's also French bassoon, um, yeah. German bassoon. And usually there's a lot of lobbying. Like some orchestras in France, they will never open to German bassoon because they want to keep the French bassoon. So it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. So flute is very lucky. Yeah. And you can play also the piccolo. That's no problem for you. Or do you have special education for the piccolo? Or... Uh, I did take a special uh, course at school for uh, for specializing also in uh, in piccolo. Yeah. Um, but it's not my... my uh, it's you not don't necessary. prefer it? No, I don't prefer it. I like it very much when, uh, when, yeah. when specialists are playing it, like uh, Beatrice, my colleague. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I do play it, uh, I don't like it that much, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have a question. I can, how many time do we have? To... I think uh, one one or two more questions would be great. Okay. Thanks. For for Bertie, uh, you uh, conducted in Finland. And I think I have read uh, in papers or something like that from uh, Klaus Mekkele 
that uh, education in Finland is uh, starting from the beginning on that uh, you are going in front of the orchestra. Is that uh, with you? Uh, did it happen with you also from the from, from the first beginning? How starts the education of a conductor? Yeah, and and there is now this Finnish, uh, what's the word? Finnish um, explosion of conductors. You know, yeah. there also Tarmo. Um, who yeah. you in Rotterdam, and um, I think actually in England um, and and in a lot of Europe actually that unfortunately you don't get so much time with the orchestra when you're learning, and so for instance when I was learning I had a lot of one-on-one -on -one lessons with my teacher in my masters, and then some time with the student orchestra of the conservatoire but very little time with professional orchestras while I was a student. And I do think that's a huge advantage that if you if you get that chance, it's such a lucky thing to have because you learn so much from being in front of an orchestra and feeling the pressure and listening and learning from how an orchestra can play together in a way that student orchestras, even if they're really good, they kind of don't play together in quite the same way. Um, so I think it's a great thing that they have in Finland and you know, maybe we can take it into England and, and other places as well. Okay. Uh, maybe the last question that depends on Ken. But uh, I have one question for Leana. Uh, she mentioned already in the competition, uh, they used the Rotterdam Philharmonic, but also other orchestras. And which orchestras uh, did you uh, use for that? Yeah. Um, so last year, uh, we had the Symphonia of Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. uh, they were involved in the selection rounds and also during the competition for the proms, the open air concert. Um, last year, we had the Doolen Ensemble for the contemporary round. And um, next year, next time, it will be uh, Klangforum Wien. So the specialist ensemble from Vienna. And we also work together with the orchestra of the 18th century, which we're very okay. happy about. Yeah. But also with very small orchestras, do you do you use it? Uh, well, the uh, contemporary round is with a with a smaller ensemble. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Ken. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Ryan, for uh, assembling and posing all those good questions. And thank you, everybody, for uh, for sending those questions in. Uh, um, uh, Leana, did you? Uh, I, I didn't hear it. Did you do an, an uh, a plea for for guest families uh, while you were here? Oh, sorry, I need to unmute you. Yes, thank you for mentioning that, Ken, because um, we uh, uh, when we invited twenty four candidates to Rotterdam next year. We very much would like um, them to be hosted by um, private families. Um, so if uh, you want to have a young conductor in your house or apartment for a couple of days, um, uh, we'd be very happy if you uh, want to let us know. And um, they could be a nice experience also for the conductors to have somebody local. And um, yeah, it would be... Uh, be great i mean who, who wouldn't want to have the next birdie in, exactly. you know, in your home yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right well listen uh, i really thank everybody for uh for joining us this evening